Hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. I'm really excited to present a brand new talk on everything you wanted to know about making our packages but were afraid to ask. So I've split this talk into five parts. The first is motivations. Why would you want to make a package? So I'll ask here, how many people in this audience have ever made an R package? So OK, it looks like maybe around 40%, 50%. All right, so we'll start off with that. Why would you want to uh, become part of this group? Next, the making. What are uh, some of the tools that can help you make R packages? We'll then move on to documentation. How do you write about your package um, so that people can understand the value of it? How can you improve your package? So once you've got your basic package working, um, what are some ways to uh, make it even stronger? And finally, how can you market your package? So why make a package? Uh, for some of the people here who haven't made one, uh, maybe one thing you're thinking is, is it making packages for real programmers? So you know, I'm just uh, an R user, and I, and I write scripts. I do data analysis. Like, um, you know, is this really for me? Isn't it like, really hard and really advanced? And I want to ask all of you uh, a couple questions. So first, you've got this. We can actually all make packages, because if you can answer yes to these questions, you can make a package. Can you open and run R slash R Studio? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> can you install a package? Also, maybe sometimes. <laughs> can you write R code? Can you write an R function? Actually, an addendum to that. Can you learn to write an R function, even if you haven't ever before? And if you can do that, yes, you can absolutely write a package. Another concern you might have is, well, you know, does making a package take a lot of time? And this is a nice quote from Hilary Parker's great blog post on making an R package from scratch, where she said, it took me such little time that she wished she could go back and make the package the first moment she saw it. So she'd been thinking of this as this big thing for her to do, and actually it was relatively straightforward and was really helpful in her future work. Now, of course, every time you write a function, it doesn't necessarily mean you should write a package. So when is it time? Well, you might have heard this about writing functions, that if you've copied and pasted code three times, it's time to write a function. And the idea behind this is that uh, you know, when you're copying and pasting code, it introduces the possibility for error. Um, it, it makes your code more, more verbose. Um, so it might be time to write a function. And I'd say, if you've used the same function across three analyses, it's a good time to write a package. And think about what are things you do over and over again that should be easy, that are hard. What are the things that you think, wow, this would have been really useful to have a month ago? So it's not a, a function or something you've written that's really specific to the uh, analysis you're working on right then, but solves a generalizable problem. Because there are a lot of benefits to making a package. Even if you just use it for yourself, even if you never share it with anyone, it can save yourself time and reduce the risk of error. But you might also share it within your company or your team. Uh, so a package is a way of bundling your code together and make it really easily shareable, and also putting that code together with documentation so people understand how they can use your function. And finally, if you do decide to share your package publicly, it's a great way to uh, give back to the community. Because how many, here, how many people here never use an R package, only use base R? No one, right? We all benefit, you know, whether it's a tidyverse, whether it's spatial analysis, whether it's data.table, we all have benefited from people in the R community making packages and sharing those publicly. So how do you make a package? Well, there are two really great tools that can help you. DevTools and Use This. Uh, many of you might be familiar with DevTools, even if you've never made a package. It's, for example, how uh, you can install a package from GitHub. Uh, and it's been around for a while, and it was developed to, uh, primarily around making writing packages easier. But there's a really cool new package called Use This, um, which, among other things, uh, takes some parts of DevTools, but also adds some new functionality around writing package. And I'll say it's basically completely magic. So how do you create a package? Well, you start by loading the Use This library, and then you use the uh, function create underscore package. You give it a file path, and at the end of that file path is your package name. So I decided to write a package for this talk called New York R Conf. And then I'm going to make an uh, R function in it that's called I love New York R Conf. So what does this function do? Well, you have to answer true or false. 
And you know, here, if you give the true answer, you get one response. If you give false, you get another one. So if you give true, I mean, how could you not? That'll just make Jared and the whole team very happy. And if you answer false, it's very sad. And I, and I hope by the end of these two days, um, you will have you know, love this conference as, as much as I love it. Well, now we have this basic function. Let's add some documentation. Uh, I really recommend writing function documentation early, as soon as you finish a function. Now, in this case, the function I showed, it was, it was relatively simple, right? It was just uh, maybe seven, eight lines of code. There was only one argument. So even if you come back to it in six months, you could, you could figure out what it does. You could read it again. But that's not going to be the case for all your functions. You might have a function that goes 100 lines of code. Maybe it has uh, you know, five or six arguments. So it's really helpful, even just for yourself, to write down and explain um, what the function is doing and how. Uh, because it's useful not just for other people, but for yourself. So how do you write function documentation? You start off by um, using this use this function, use Roxygen MD. And you only need to use this once when making a package. This will set up the framework. And then what you do, you go to your friendly R Studio, and you go and you insert Roxygen skeleton. So what this is going to do is insert the, um, a way for you to write documentation. And when I first saw this, I was a little bit intimidated because I'd never seen this form of like the comments and the apostrophes. But it's just a way that for R to take what you write here and translate into documentation. So I've written things like the title, the parameters, the arguments, what those are, um, what it returns, and an example. So how that translates is once that's finished, you can then document your package. You can have R process this. And then you can look it up just like you would any other function documentation in another package. And we can see how what you've written here now will translate to that. So the title I wrote um, will go into be the title in the description. The parameter value will go under the arguments section. And we'll also see the example. So this is how we write documentation for our functions. But how do you document your overall package? Uh, and why this is important is function documentation is really helpful when you know what you're looking for, right? You know the name of the function. Maybe you vaguely uh, recall, like, oh, yeah, I think I use this function here. I just don't remember exactly how it works. You do that question mark. But how do you get people to understand even what's the purpose of your package? Well, an R package comes with a description file. And so here's one for the New York R conf. So it has a couple sections here. Um, some have been filled out, like the title, and I filled out the authors. But there's a couple empty sections. So here we see that the title right now is this filler title that it starts it off with. Same with the description. So these are things that you're going to want to fill out. Um, and we'll see how they become important when uh, your package has them. I find it helpful to think of package documentation as a pyramid. So we start at the top with the name of the package, which is going to um, evoke what the package does. Then we go down and we get a little more verbose with a title, which is one sentence, a description, one paragraph, a readme, and then finally, a vignette. And I want to emphasize that I find package documentation is really important for explaining the value of the package and introducing the main function. So telling people why they should care about the package and what problem it might help them solve. What's in a name? In our case, when you create a package, you do have to name it. So this is a choice I've already made. I've called it New York RConf. But you know, if I was writing a more serious package, there's a couple of things I'd consider. One is that it's not taken on CRAN. So even if right now the package is just for yourself, you want to leave the option open that maybe someday you do want to submit it. And you won't be able to if it's a, a package name that's already been taken on CRAN. It's not too long. You don't want people typing in library, this is a really long function uh, package name, and there's lots of room for typos. Right? That wouldn't be very nice to your users, not very nice to yourself either. It's easy to Google. So you know, there are some packages that have common names um, and some really great ones I love, like uh, Janitor, um, Broom, which I'll talk about a little later. But an advantage that other ones like ggplot2 and dplyr have over that is when you Google it, the first things that pop up will be the package, because these are not um, you know, common household items um, or have other uses. Uh, and finally, we have evokes what it does. So this is um, you know, really important. It's great if someone can understand just from hearing your package name, get an idea of what it does. So again, some examples might be string R, right? OK, it seems like something that's probably working with strings. A package that can help you with this is the available package from ROpenSci. So what this does is if you give it your potential package name, it'll check things like, is it available on CRAN and on GitHub? 
Um, it will give you some things like, is there a sentiment associated with this? Here are the Wikipedia pages and even Urban Dictionary. So you can check that there aren't any unintended meanings <laughs> behind your package name. Always good, especially, uh, yeah, you, know, you never know what people come up with. Uh, now, there may be some other more esoteric considerations. Uh, so here's Sam Tyner talking about uh, the PER package and how uh, she was explaining it to a colleague uh, that it's PER, you know, P-U-R-R-R. -R -R. There are three R's. And Mar Averick comes in and explaining why. And it's because Hadley wanted it to line up nicely with tidy R and dply R. So that's why the PER package has three R's in it. So you may let other considerations come in besides the one I showed. Now a title for your package. It describes what the package does. And it has to be one sentence and ideally less than 65 characters. Um, so again, this goes in the description file I showed you. But if you share your package on GitHub, it also goes on top of the GitHub page and in the Google preview results. So a couple of good examples is Dpl uh, Dplyr. It's a grammar of data manipulation. Shiny, easy interactive web applications with R. RCPP, seamless R and C++ integration. And what's really nice about this is they, even though it's pretty short, it tells you what the package does, but it also gives you a bit of that value, right? It's not just R and C++ integration, it's seamless integration. It's easy interactive web applications. So these are some really nice examples of how even in a short amount of space, your title can be really helpful. A description is one paragraph that's focused on the value of your package. Uh, so here's the Broom package I mentioned earlier, and I really like uh, its description because it does a couple things. It starts with a summary sentence. Um, so this is about, uh, we see, summarizes key information about statistical objects and tidy tibbles. It then goes into the benefits. Why is this helpful? Well, it makes it easy to report results or work with a large number of models at once. And in Broom's case, it has three main functions. And so it makes sense in the description to describe those three functions and talk about what it does. A README um, is, a, is a nice, uh, little bit longer form documentation, but ideally not too long. And it's a great place to point people where to start and where to go next. Uh, you know, many people might only see this um, and, and not read the longer form documentation I talk about with the vignette. So to README, a good place to start is an overview. Uh, this is the four cats README, which I help contribute to in the Tidyverse Developer Day. And it starts out with, what's the goal of four cats? Well, it's to make working with factors easier. Um, I show some of the functions that the forecats package has and why you might want to use them. And I also point people to where they can learn more. <coughs> Next, I give some installation instructions. And this is helpful as well to know if the package is on CRAN, if you can use install.packages. I then give some examples. So in, in the README case, you don't want to necessarily overwhelm people, but it's helpful to give you know, one or two examples of how a person might use this. So in this case, I give an example of how fct underscore lump can take a factor with lots of levels and put the ones that aren't very frequent into one factor level called other. A vignette is this longer form. Um, it's a case study. It's, I advise to use real and interesting data for this. Um, so don't make something like A, B, and C and like very artificial for how you would use your package. It's really nice to give people an example of how could they use this in the real world. If it's a statistics package, you can use it, make a model. If it's a visualization package, make a graph. So it really makes sense to tailor to what the goal of your package is. So in this case with four cats, um, because four cats is working with factors, um, some functions there are helpful with graphs. So in this case, I show how a four cats uh, function can help reorder your graph into the uh, ascending order. Um, I also repeat a little bit of the README um, and show with FCT lump. So it's OK here to be repetitive. It's OK to have some shared things across your documentation. Because again, people might not see them all. Well, now you have a pretty good package, and it's nicely documented. How can you improve it? And there are, of course, lots of ways, but I want to concentrate on one. So who's had this before, where something's working, it's going great, everything's fine? <laughs> and then right where you need it, it just completely falls out from under you. So how can you prevent these cases? Solution here is unit tests. So this is a nice quote from Hadley Wickham, which says, you may think I am making these silly mistakes on purpose, for teaching purposes. That is not true. I make these mistakes all the time, and it's the unit test that saves me. So it doesn't matter how good an R programmer you are. Um, you will eventually make some mistakes, or when you're refactoring your package, something that worked before will break. And so unit tests are how you can de keep developing safely. How you can write tests. You first set up with use this use underscore test that. Um, and just like use Roxygen MD, this is something you only have to do once. And this sets up the structure. 
And then you make a file, use tests for I love New York R conference. So in this case, I made two tests. I wanted to test that um, the function defaults to true and that it fails if it's given not a logical. So tests that works, you do things like expect underscore equal. In this case, expect underscore error. I expect this to throw an error. I expect this to be true. I expect this to be greater than. So you write down your expectations, and then um, you can have it so that you check. When you're developing new functions, you can always be checking that it's passing your tests. So I really recommend to write them early and often, because that way you can safely iterate knowing that your core functionality is not affected. And whenever you fix a bug, put in a test that would have caught that. Because again, that's an error you've already seen happen. Um, and you know, just because it's happened once, it absolutely can happen again, even if you fix it. So write something that would catch that and let you know if it's reintroduced. So our final thing is, how do you market your package? And I'd like to start by saying, marketing is not a bad word. I think it can have a negative connotation, but it's equally important even if it's something just used within your company or team. Um, because marketing will help people know um, what they can get out of your package, and it helps them. It's not a selfish thing. You've written this because it's useful for you, um, and that makes it very likely that it's useful for other people. So the documentation was a great start. A vignette, a readme will all help explain the value. Um, but there are a couple ways you can go beyond that. The first is to publish your package on GitHub. Uh, if you're not familiar with Git or GitHub, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but I highly recommend reading Jenny Bryan's book, Happy Git and GitHub for the User, because it will walk you through step by step how to get started. And this is a way that really lets you easily share your package with other people, um, and also eventually maybe have other people contribute to it too, because GitHub allows folks to file issues if something's not working for them. A pull request, which is, hey, um, I've written some code that maybe is an additional test or fixes a bug, and I think can help develop your package. So it's a nice way um, to integrate, to have the community help with your package development as well. Make a website with package down. So I actually just made one for a package uh, that I wrote just a few days ago, and I really liked how easy it was. So you use the package down uh, function build site. Um, you push it to GitHub. You change one little setting, and voila, you have a whole package. And what this does is package down takes the readme you've written, the vignette, the details in your descriptions. We see the developers here on the right. And it takes all of that what you've already written and just repurposes that into a website. So once you've done that documentation, it's really easy to then make a website and share that with more people. You can blog and tweet about it. This is a nice tweet from Jim Hester about his package room. Uh, I recommend if you do this, use the rstats hashtag. It's a really great way to have folks, even if they don't follow you, uh, to find out and discover your package. Give the, a one-line motivation. What, again, what problem would this help users so solve? Why would they care? So in this case, it's to read CSV, TSV, and fix with files quickly. You can re remix your readme and vignette. Um, in this blog post. So again, there's a, there's a common um, you know, uh, idea of dry. Don't repeat yourself in programming. And I'd actually say with documentation, repeating yourself is good. Again, maybe some people will find your blog. Some people will find the readme. Some people will find the package down site. Uh, some people will see the vignette. It's OK to have one core message across all of these things and to be reusing some stuff, again, tailored for that format. And the final thing is you can submit your package to CRAN. And this could be a whole talk in itself. But I will just say with Hadley's um, quote here that the majority of our users do not install packages from GitHub. So GitHub is a great way to start sharing your package. But if you want it to be really widely used, it will have to go to CRAN. Um, that being said, I think it's nice to wait to submit to CRAN until you have a stable user-facing API. You don't want to go ahead and submit if you're going to be changing a ton of things that will mean the functionality users have come to depend on will change. Finally, if you're successful, um, you can see this is my brother DRob here about his broom package, how he felt when he first got his uh, first GitHub pull request. Right? It was really exciting. The community was engaging. Mickey's happy. How he feels now when he looks at the GitHub issues for broom. <laughs> Fortunately, broom has been taken over by another maintainer, maybe for this reason. Um, so it is a really exciting thing. Um, you know, and, and, and eventually, it, it can become you know, bigger than you ever imagined. So I'd like to end this talk with just a few resources. First, can I get a bit of a drum roll, please? There is a new R package book in the works. So the first R package book from Hadley Wickham a couple years ago, excellent resource, but didn't have some of the newer tools like use this. Uh, Jenny Bryan is now writing a new edition with Hadley. Um, it's still in development, but you can find it at r-packages.org. It's 
already excellent. It's, uh, again, it's still in the works, but has some really great new material and from the advanced R. Some other resources that are really helpful, I won't go through them all, but these are some great um, blog posts and tutorials on different parts of writing a package. And with that, thank you all so much and look forward to speaking to you for the rest of the conference.